Well, hi, everybody. It's uh, Kim Winter, Logistics Executive Group, um, uh, recommencing our uh, series of interviews with business leaders and particular logistics and supply chain leaders around the world. Um, my pleasure today to uh, be uh, joined by uh, senior uh, postal and logistics and supply chain specialist all the way from Dubai, Stephen Stanton. Hey, Stephen. Good morning, Kim. And thanks, thanks for joining us. Uh, Stephen, I'm just going to give our, our listeners and our viewers uh, a few, few heads up on, uh, on your background. So you're the Chief Business Officer of Parcels and Express with Emirates Post Group or EPG. Um, you've been with them for some time now. Um, you were prior to that, you were the Senior Executive Director for Mail Operations and then prior to that, um, Executive Director. So a bit of a career track going on there, Steve. Um, prior to that, you were with uh, SIVA, General Manager for Transportation for the uh, Manaka region. Um, and uh, prior to that, TNT Operations Director, Middle East, um, road Networks and Fleet Manager, prior to that, DHL, Middle East Road Networks, and uh, you hail all the way from Liverpool, I understand. Middlesbrough, actually, it's Middlesbrough, in the northeast of England. Middlesbrough, uh, my great, my grandmother and my great-grandmother were from Middlesbrough, so I'm told, so uh, yeah, awesome to, uh, to speak to an alumni in terms of geography. Hey, Stephen, give us a bit of a rundown. We always ask our guests to give us a bit of a heads up on their personal upbringing, childhood, where they came from and how they ended up where they are today. So maybe you can give us uh, a few tips on, on the background for Stephen Stanton. Okay. Uh, so as you mentioned, I was uh, born and raised in Middlesbrough. It's a, a town in the northeast of England in the UK. A uh, very industrial town, um, a lot of heavy industry, steel works, chemical works. Uh, raised in a very uh, happy family background. Uh, both uh, parents were very hard working. Mum was a teacher and uh, a deputy headmistress, and my father worked in the chemical industry. Uh, so I uh, stayed in and around the Middlesbrough area until university. Uh, Travelled over to Liverpool, actually. Um, did four years in Liverpool, um, and then took a role uh, upon leaving university, you moved to Glasgow, uh, and I was there for around six to nine months, moved back to Middlesbrough uh, to be with uh, my family, uh, and ended up working in British Steel before I uh, decided on the move over to the Middle East. Right. So, yeah, we're here in the north of England and Glasgow, uh, pretty, pretty tough areas, uh, as you say, industrial areas, so obviously uh, a good rugged upbringing for you. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you ended up in the Middle East or Middle East of all places. Uh, it was a role of circumstance, really. I was uh, working with a guy in uh, British Steel at the time, and uh, he arrived back into work one Sunday on uh, Monday morning with the story of being in Bahrain for the weekend. Um, I'd never heard of Bahrain, and uh, so I quickly had a look on the map. And literally nine months later, uh, I had uh, an offer to move over to work with. Uh, DHL. Um, so February 20, uh, February 2002, uh, I entered the world of logistics and entered the, uh, the Middle East. Awesome. So we hear, you know, a lot of people think of postal organisations or the post office as it used to be called in many, many countries or most countries, especially when we were growing up, um, as the place where the mail came and, and, you know, the mailman used to come around and deliver the mail and it was a very traditional and usually owned by governments uh, type organisation. Um, what is a most what does a modern postal organization look like and and what sort of changes have taken place in recent years uh, leading up into the last year or so? I, it's an uh, industry in transformation and Emirates Post is an organization in transformation Kim. Um, you know the, the, the model here in the UE is slightly different to other parts of the world. you know we run a PO box system as opposed to, uh, having hundreds of uh, postmen uh, walking around and driving around the country delivering mail to doors. Uh, we certainly offer those services, but the standard uh, precept of the, um, the the postal service here is uh, is based on the PO box system. And uh, the, it's changing rapidly. I mean, it's been well known for many years that uh, normal mail, you know, letters and postcards, it, it has been in decline um, in certainly single, nearly double-digit figures for many years. So that's 
driven our requirement to transform. You know, there is a pre a misconception about postal industry that you know it can be quite old and antiquated and uh, and living in years gone by. But that's certainly not the case here at Emirates Post. Um, we've had to ride the transformation, uh, and it, it, it manifests itself in many many different ways. So be it an organisational uh, structural redesign. Uh, to new services, to the move into digital services, uh, to really bring us up to speed and allow us to be competitive. Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, our organisation uh, across about uh, 13 to 14 offices around the world, um, I, when I looked at the stats, I think something in the order of 20 to 30 percent of uh, the recruitment and the executive search that our group has been um, handling over the last year or two years mm -hmm. has been in the parcel express and postal, um, so CEP uh, area of, of the economy. Um, what's, what's driving the transformation and is, it, is this a structural thing from um, upstream in the supply chain or is it downstream in terms of consumer patterns and habits? And what sort of skills are, uh, and I know a lot of private sector, people from the likes of DHL and Kuna Nagel and SF Express and a lot of the express parcel companies globally have been inducted into postal organisations all over the world. Asia Pac, where we've got about five offices, uh, India here, Europe. Um, what, what's what's driving that change? And again, what what sort of skills is uh, are postal groups looking for? Well, it's almost certainly consumer behaviour, Tim. I mean, uh, Kim, we, um, we we went through the COVID period as everyone did, and that was a benefit to to what we do from a, a CEP perspective because the the shift to online shopping um, uh, well, it was massive here in the UAE. You know, the, 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 the culture uh, here is of retail. Uh, there's a lot of shopping malls and a lot of uh, retail is a pastime uh, from, a, from a hobby perspective to, for, to a certain extent. So that transition to online shopping drove parcels and express exponentially over the period of many, over the period of a few months and certainly over the year, you know, our, our parcel volumes domestically increased 100% between March and uh, October in the year. So that change in consumer behaviour uh, it drove the transformation that we already had in planning. You know, we're in the midst of a five-year plan. Um, from a postal perspective, we uh, we were quite in a beneficial situation because many years ago we had an old uh, brand called M Post, and M Post was a domestic courier service. So that last mile network, coupled with the postal network that we have and the postal infrastructure through the branches and the the domestic network and the airport facilities and the international outbound exports and import capabilities put us in a great position for CEP. Um, and if you, you mentioned the, the transition of people there, that really, when you look at the team that we have now, a lot of the experience that has joined us as we've been growing over the last few years has come from the courier and express industry. Um, and competitors and another organisation. You, you mentioned my background was uh, DHL and, and TNT when I first arrived in the Middle East uh, all those years ago. And that that uh, that addition of express knowledge and express mentality on top of the the postal way of doing things uh, has certainly allowed us to transform and ride that wave of transformation growth. Sure. And, and would you say, you mentioned obviously the experience of the last uh, 12 to 15 months or so during the conditions of the pandemic. Um, we've seen, and I'm sure a lot of the audience are part of that whole movement of the extreme growth in parcel and e-commerce and home delivery last mile. Again, big chunk of the search and recruitment activity that we've been doing has been in that last mile e-commerce space especially. Um, and there seems to be an endless demand and the, and the trajectory of growth just seems to be bounding onwards and onwards. So um, in, that, in that regard, uh, is the majority of work that Emirates Post Group or companies like EPG do is it on the pickup side or is it on the delivery side? And, and what drives that, that difference between the two? 
It's both, Kim. The uh, you know, we, we offer the door-to-door service, so you, you can't have one without the other. You can't have domestic first mile and uh, without domestic last mile if you want to offer that portfolio of services. Um, it's a little bit different in the international transition because uh, we, we offer first mile uh, and then we arrange and organise the, the middle mile, the international airline hall. But the postal system in the uh, from a global perspective, we work under the premise of the UPU, the Universal Postal Union, and we work with all the postal partners around the world uh, to provide bilateral services. Uh, so we would do the pickup, for example, we do the first mile and we have a partnership through the UPU with what any of the global postal operators to complete the last mile. So the international is slightly different to domestic, as in uh, domestic we control the whole chain. Uh, our whole focus, and you, you referenced there about a lot of people coming into the the best the, the, the last mile arena, it, it, it's it's a complex element, although in theory what we do is we pick things up and we deliver them. Mm-hmm. Um, but getting the last mile right, getting it efficient, making it uh, uh, customer centric and making it built to what the customer needs uh, is so important and that I uh, how you're seeing the drive of people moving into that arena not only from the traditional uh, on the ground um, frontline people who uh, uh, who support the, uh, the the services we provide you know the couriers the supervisors the back office team but also from a tech point of view and from a knowledge point of view is bringing in that tech uh, to support what we're doing, we have a strategic initiative called the Best Last Mile. And we intend, we fully intend to have the Best Last Mile service across the UE. And that supports obviously domestic services, but also the inbound international services when they plug in to the uh, the Last Mile uh, network that we have. Well, thanks for explaining that. Um, you, you mentioned the UPU, um, and I want you to just drill down on that a little bit because it's something we hear a lot of and, and have to recruit towards uh, if we're looking for people who've got some UPU experience. Can you explain to our audience just exactly what the UPU is um, and, and is it something that, that, that every, every postal group has to belong to or is it something that they choose to belong to and what are the advantages of belonging to it? I th- certainly think there's a benefit of, uh, of belonging to um, because the... The agreements, there's a, the framework of the UPU is a global organization that connects all of the postal entities around the world. Um, if you compare that, for example, to a traditional integrator, one of the big uh, express integrators, they have operations at origin, they have operations at destination country, and then they have their middle mile organizations either with their own airlines or, or through uh, commercial PAX flights or, or, or cargo flights. The UPU doesn't have that benefit in that the origin entity and the destination entity are very, very different commercial entities or governmental entities, as you mentioned before. So the UPU framework allows and supports those entities to work together in a, in a seamless manner. And it governs the rules of engagement. It governs how, uh, element, how, how processing occurs. It, uh, it rules and governs the service level agreements between the entities based on the different services that we have. Uh, and it also governs the, uh, the the way that everyone's recompensed for dealing with each other. So it's, it's a really, really important entity um, that, uh, that that brings together hundreds and hundreds of postal entities around the world into one operating framework uh, that can support the services that we support. Yeah, that's interesting. It's quite a unique organisation. And when you think about the private sector playing against government or public sector organisations, um, there's quite there's quite a, a bit of dynamic going on there, and in that regard, um, to what extent do postal groups tend to interplay with um, with private sector? So, for example, I'm thinking of Australia Post. Um, many of the tier one and tier two uh, parcel and express organisations, uh, and many many of the e-commerce startups, uh, tier ones and tier two and tier, tier three e-commerce uh, organisations, um, leverage uh, not only a private sector company, but they'll also leverage uh, Australia Post because in the Aussie Post example, they have one of the they have the biggest reach and network as part of the government mandate because it's such a big country, the size of the US, but only 25 million people. 
So there's got to be a delivery network and not ever, not everybody else can really afford to provide that full delivery network. Um, so so you do, do you intersect a lot with private network? Do you provide services to them? Or is it a competitive situation where you won't supply services to them so you can maintain uh, a bigger market share? How does it work? <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the EU is a very competitive market, Kim. Um, the, we're, we're in quite a unique situation here. Um, and I, I say that because we, we do work very closely with the integrators. Uh, and you mentioned one of the scenarios there. We have, uh, because of the network that we have uh, built over the years from both a last mile perspective and the, the retail network, which is our network of post offices around the country, you know, we're, we're everywhere. We are pan UAE, so we're from Silla in the west to Fujairah in the east down to Alain in the south. Um, that network reach is not always available to um, the, the, the express players. Uh, so we work with quite a number of players in providing those services. Likewise, uh, we work with a number of the express players to support a very rapid uh, express international service or premium international service um, that, that the postal network doesn't necessarily support in every country. Um, but, you know, it's, it, the UE is a small player. Knows everyone. Uh, there's a lot of friends and camaraderie that have been built up over the years. So it's, um, there's a there, there's a certainly a competitive element there because we play in the same market. Um, but we seem to have a happy balance between uh, how we uh, how we work together and how we compete at the same time. Okay, um, you know, from a corporate advisory perspective, we and I'm sure a lot of other providers in the space in the Middle East, Asia in particular are engaged with a whole range of projects around digitization and transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and postal groups are certainly right up there and some of the biggest players in that digitization. Just to what extent is digitization on the agenda? Is it at the top of the agenda or is it in the middle of the agenda uh, for postal groups and why? Uh, I, I can't I can talk about the, the other postal entities. Yeah. So in detail um, but from an Emirates post perspective it's, it's top of the agenda Kim. you know it's everything really? from uh, it's you look at all the touch points that we have um, from a last mile perspective from a service and a product perspective uh, you know, ultimately remember we we're, uh, we were driven by uh, what the, uh, the the UE the, the ambitions of the UE government were very much aligned with uh, what their ambitions are uh, and the leadership in the UAE is 100% focused on development, digitization, and providing uh, excellent services across the board. So we follow that mandate as, uh, very closely. And that means, you know, from a last mile perspective, we're looking at the tech that supports the, uh, the customer interactions, so excelling in customer experience, but also the efficiency elements that allow us to plan the delivery routes, for example. From a service and a product perspective, um, we recently launched uh, earlier this year the EP Box, which is a virtual PO Box. Um, so it's a, it's away from the traditional physical PO Box. It allows a customer to uh, uh, dictate and determine uh, on an app or on the website how they would like to receive their items physically. But in addition to that, there are new services launched which are secure digital services allowing the, um, the sending and receiving of secure information, secure data, secure documents uh, in, a, in a tight legal framework um, on a digital platform. So it's moving away from the physical. And, you know, we mentioned earlier the, the decline in physical mail over the years is, uh, is only going to increase. So these digital services now are so important. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess it's uh, just part of the dynamic of, of market being driven by changes in consumer patterns. I mean, to, to what extent has, has consumer, I mean, as you say, you mentioned earlier on, malls in the Middle East in particular are uh, not only a pastime, but they're, uh, they're part of the social and economic fabric in a big way. I think that some of the biggest malls in the world are in the Middle East region and the footfall and malls uh, in the Middle East is as big, if not bigger, than anywhere else uh, on, on accumulation around uh, around the world. To from your perspective, uh, where do you see consumer uh, behaviour going, given the massive uptick in, in home ordering? 
product from home and deliveries to home. Um, and what, what do you see in the main drivers there? What, what, what do you predict in the next 12 months or so? Okay, uh, the, as I said, the retail is it's, it's part of the fabric of society here, but, uh, and there's been so much investment and there's so much investment in retail space continuing. Uh, it must be quite a dilemma for the, uh, for, for the retailers around the region in terms of the strategy because customers are demanding home deliveries. You know, it is a common demand now. And I think what happened in COVID is that COVID only accelerated that demand. It's here to stay at a higher level. And maybe it's brought forward the growth two or three years um, from, a, from, from a volume perspective as a result of COVID. But that balance from a retailer perspective of having, you know, everyone talks about omni-channel, having the omni-channel service where uh, you, have a, you have your physical stores, you have your online stores, and you have other methods of, uh, of communicating your services and your sales to your customers is, is ever more important now. We do see a growth, obviously, in the, the pure e-commerce player. Um, you know, the, the, for anything from an SME to the growth of uh, the, big, the big players here, the Amazon. Um, you know, they're, they're all growing and the, the, the way that the government encourages entrepreneurialism in, in this country, in this, this part of the world is, is phenomenal. So I, I think yeah. the, the growth of the smaller SME type e-commerce player is only going to continue. Sure. Yeah, um, there's been a number of uh, conferences that have been uh, held up around the region recently and then certainly consumer behaviour e-commerce, as it is elsewhere in the world, is just is a major top-of-mind subject and the, and the dynamics and the transition going on there is, is, is enormous. Um, Stephen, well, I always... I think, sorry, go ahead. I think, I think it's important also to reference the, the, the non-e-commerce uh, uh, economies within the UAE. I mean, one of our, our mainstays from, from a historical perspective was the banking industry and the governmental industry. Mm. They, they continue to grow. Um, they're yep. bringing on services, new products, digital onboarding, for example, where in the last mile, you're actually onboarding the customer as a new customer for the bank. You know, you're not just delivering yeah. a credit card anymore. You're not just delivering a bank, uh, bank card or a checkbook. You have a digital platform with you where you're recording the biometrics of the customer uh, and actually onboarding the customer on behalf of the bank. So this uh, digitization in the other industries is driving what we're doing as well. Right, you know, you know, I know that uh, the uh, leadership in the UAE, in particular, has a very high focus on uh, rating of performance and KPIs, um, and uh, all organisations are expected to to rank and rate. Uh, to, and there's some sort of competition, I, I understand, right across organisations that are related to government. Um, as to how they perform, um, what what sort of measurements and and what sort of uh, structures does EPG hold in that regard? Well, our focus is on service, service, service. You know, development and improvement and continuous improvement. And you can only do that with solid performance management and uh, a real solid set of KPIs. Um, so we, we have indicators both functionally and organisationally. We have balanced scorecards. Um, what well, you know, you you look at the the typical performance management framework that needs to be in place, and we've got that, and it's been consistently developed. Uh, and the, the KPIs are very very visible. You know, anyone from uh, the, the the frontline couriers, they see their performance on a frequent basis, uh, as do the board, um, and then all the stakeholders have access to, uh, to to how we're performing and how we're more importantly how we're improving. Right. Well, thanks for sharing that. Stephen, I know you've got a, a busy day lined up. It's still early in the morning. Um, I always like to talk to our guests uh, about a quick couple of quick fire questions in regards to leadership and talent. So uh, from a personal perspective, so uh, you've been around, you've been in interesting leadership roles for the majority of your, your senior life. And uh, what I'd be interested to know from you would be what would be your one or two tips for fellow leaders, whether they be in supply chain or just broader business, over the next 12 months with the sort of turbulence and the sort of dynamics that we can expect to see um, across the world or across the region over the next 12 months. What would be one or two tips that you'd share with colleagues? I think when when it's coming down to, uh, to, 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 to the team, 
Okay, there's, there's two things I would normally look for in, uh, in, in the people that, uh, that uh, I, I'm part of the team with. Uh, number one is people who can make decisions. You know, it, there's a massive difference between having all the knowledge and, uh, uh, and not being able to make those on the ground uh, rapid decisions sometimes that are required. You know, they, they, the only way to gather momentum and gain speed and gain uh, flexibility and, 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 and enforce your continuous development is to have people that are confident to make the right decision at the right time. And don't be afraid of failure. Failure is such a powerful thing. You can learn so much by your mistakes. And the one thing we consistently commit across the team here is to, just don't be afraid of failing. Just be prepared. If you do fail, put it back and work on another option and understand why something didn't go quite right. So that decision-making and fear of uh, lack of fear of failure is, is so important. Um, the other thing i say, it just make sure you, uh, it, it, the, the people that are around you don't expect to be the master of everything and the, the, the knowledge, the fountain of all knowledge because people have such vast experience. So surround yourself with people that are much better than you and don't be afraid of it because it'll all complement towards results. Uh, and and it's, it, on, on, at times people can be worried about that and they feel threatened, but there's certainly no need to be because the collective team needs to come out of that are very, very important. Wise words. I, I'd like to, I can't think of a day when I haven't failed at something and uh, I've been around for a long time. So <laughs> there's no doubt we, uh, we learn best from our mistakes. So uh, appreciate, <laughs> appreciate you sharing that. Uh, final question for you, quick fire. Um, there are a lot of people who are transitioning, and we see this in our practice, and of course, you no doubt do as well across business. A lot of people are moving from areas which have not been so fortunate during the last year or so, uh, with the heavy economic impact, especially on, on speaking to tourism and aviation and hospitality. Um, not only in uh, the Middle East region, but elsewhere around the world, of course, we're seeing a lot of people by necessity needing to transition out of those uh, areas of employment and industry that have been greatly affected um, into the growth areas. Uh, and that's various areas of transport and logistics and supply chain, including, of course, um, the CEP parcel express and postal areas we talk about. If you were to give one piece of advice from the, to somebody, uh, irrespective of their age, because we've got a lot of people mid-career needing to make massive changes as well, including hundreds of thousands of pilots around the world um, and other aviation workers, as I mentioned. If there's one piece of advice for you to speak to people who are wanting to get in amongst an industry um, such as postal or express or in the e-commerce space, what would that, and they're going for an interview, what would be the one thing that you would recommend that they really push and that they really try and present about themselves to appeal to uh, that end of the uh, industrial and economic sector? Oh, I would say focus on your core skill set. You know, knowledge, people learn all the time and people can learn, uh, you can rapidly pick up new skills and, and new knowledge of a new industry. So do your homework, make sure you understand the fundamentals of the industry that you're looking into. You know, Postal is a great example because we have, uh, we struggled to find real Postal expertise uh, in the UE and in the region because we, you know, for, for years we've had the, uh, the, the operation in the network that we've had. Um, but focus on your core skill set and really emphasize how those skill sets are transferable and give examples of how they can be transferable. You know, if you thought about it in advance, me, for example, if I'm talking to someone, if they tell me I'm in banking, but this is my skill set and this is how I can apply my skill set to the postal industry, I'd be more and more interested in looking at that person uh, as being part of the team. Yeah. Right. Every, everyone can transition. And we've got great examples of it here. Our, one of our latest senior guys uh, came from the food manufacturing industry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think I know who that is. <laughs> so, yeah, fantastic. Look, I, uh, I appreciate you sharing that, that advice with the audience and myself and giving us some sage input uh, around careers in particular at this particular time when a lot of people are, are really pushing on to look to transition between their, their different areas of their career. Uh, Stephen Stanton, EPG, Emirates Post Group, 
Really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, to our audience, thank you for, again, sharing time with us. Uh, we definitely uh, appreciate the, the fact that you've got a lot on and we hope that any of the information that Stephen's been able to share is valuable for you to all of the first responders, to the people right across industry sectors, not only across supply chain and logistics, it's getting a lot of headlines at the moment, but right throughout healthcare, wellness, uh, first responders, as I say, anybody in the supply chain helping out, really appreciate it. Stay safe out there, everybody. Mask up, keep distanced, and uh, and uh, be very hygienic about what you're doing. Uh, without further ado, again, Stephen, thanks very much, and thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. It's a pleasure.